Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks, Season 3, Episode 5, with myself, Ryan. We got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. Um, so this week, guys, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. And then Sam actually had the pleasure of uh, interviewing British filmmaker Peter Goddard. So you've got that to look forward to. And then we're actually going to be discussing, well, revolutionary films or revolution within films. Um, Jack basically came up with this idea um, and we all had our own interpretation on it. So, yeah, get excited for that. But without further ado, over to you, Sam, for industry. There's a film uh, currently in production called Dolly. It's going to star Florence Pugh, Pugh? Florence Pugh? from uh, Midsummer. She's got one of those last names where it feels like there's a proper posh way to pronounce it, but you get our version. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be an Apple movie. It's written by uh, Drew Pierce, who wrote Iron Man 3 and Vanessa Taylor. And essentially, the, 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 the plot sounds a bit ridiculous. And, it could be good or it could be really bad, but it's basically about a robot companion, in other words, sex doll, who kills the owner but claims to be innocent. So it could be a good film, or it could be one of those, this is a bit ridiculous. Now, she obviously did Midsommar, which was a great film, so she may be making the right choices. Weirdly, it reminds me of a film that Darren Aronofsky was going to do a few years back, about an AI who has to go to court to prove his innocence. So I don't know if they're the same project and he's left it and it's had a few rewrites to be a sex doll. But keep an eye on it. When you said Robot Companion, my instant thought was Big Hero 6 and then you immediately crushed that by saying it's a sex doll. <laughs> it's like... Well, that's it. It's clearly a sex doll. <laughs> if you read details, it's a sex doll. You know? The greatest director, in my personal opinion, my favourite of all directors, David Cronenberg, looks to be doing something new. Now this was actually announced the week beforehand, but we didn't do it in this street, so I'm going to bring it up now. David Cronenberg is a genius and has done a lot of collaborations with Viggo Mortensen. Now Viggy is currently um, doing the tours for his film that he's recently made called um, Flawed, I believe. I might have that title wrong. But he's been talking a lot about his experiences with Cronenberg. He's been talking about the fact that they're hoping to shoot a new film this summer which he says is a very strange noir that brings Cronenberg back to his roots. Now, if you know what Cronenberg is, Cronenberg is a body horror director from the beginning. So it sounds like he's going back to horror, which is good. I mean, Cronenberg has been struggling to get funding for anything for years. He wanted to do an Eastern Promises sequel, but they wouldn't fund it. Instead, they completely wrote him and everything out and doing their own version of the sequel. So it's kind of cool to see that he's getting, there's clearly some money somewhere. And Viggy's still like a big actor. I mean, he was recently Oscar nominated for Green Book. I gotta stop calling him Viggy, but I'd rather call him Viggy than pronounce his name badly. Viggo Mortensen. <coughs> That's yeah. not. It's, it's, it's easier to say Viggo than it is to say Viggy. I love the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like your best buds with him. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just glad these two are working together. I, I've been worrying recently about certain people that I love, like Cronenberg, not getting another film because of funding and because things have changed so much. So hopefully that moves forwards. Um, recently also, Viggo Morson has been talking a lot about um, why hasn't Cronenberg ever been award recognised? And I think it's true. But then sometimes the greatest artists aren't there to be nominated for the awards, they're there to make you think. And I think Cronenberg will be lost within that. But it's good to see he's doing something new, you know? So fingers crossed for that. And hopefully, just like David Lynch, maybe Netflix might be interested. We'll see. Talking of Netflix, uh, Judd Apatow, who um, recently did The King of Stanton, he's going to do a film called The Bubble. And I think I talked about this in the industry before, but there's a bit more details now. It's essentially about a bubble of actors who have to be with each other over 12 weeks. And obviously, chaos goes forward, you know, things go a bit crazy. But it's based on, or at least they're saying it's based on, but not fully saying it, because obviously legally there's a couple of issues there. But the production of Jurassic Park 3, the, new, the Dominion, or the new one, because it's been, they've been shooting for 12 Jurassic weeks, World. and they've constantly had to stop because of COVID, and apparently there's a lot of chaos on that, and this has now made the bubble exist. They just announced the cast for it. The guy who seems to be in everything right now, much to Ryan's joy, Pedro Pascal, is the, isn't it? Yep, yep. <laughs> and Karen Gillian. Yeah, Karen now, Gillian. Apparently these two are pretty much playing the lead actors in a massive franchise that's having loads of problems. So it's Chris Pratt and um, Bryce Howard. 
And also um, Keegan Michael Kay. We all love a bit of Key. And Maria Bakalova, who of course uh, was yeah. Borat 2. This is her first big film after Borat 2. And David Duchovny's in it. So it's a great cast and they're going to be shooting in London. And I just think it's really... I know there's a lot of pandemic sort of storylines running around. But there's so much fun to have in that sort of comedy element. Because actors are obviously known for their egos and you can just play out those. And especially if it's based on certain real people. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. Maybe that maybe that'll be out by the end of the year. Seems like one if it's just one location. I guess we'll see. And finally, another version of Dracula is in the works. As I've talked about quite a few times, Universal seems to be doing this roundabout thing where people go, "What about this idea?" And they go, "Cool, let's go with that with their monsters." There's the serious takes with Invisible Man. There's going to be more monster, proper monster movies. And now there's going to be a sci-fi western take on Dracula, which actually can work because to me that just screams like an anime sort of image, you know, and space westerns do work, obviously. But it's um, Chloe Zhao and Chloe Zhao is going to be probably going to win the Oscar for Best Director for Nomadland and has just done the Marvel film The Eternals. She gave this pitch to Universal and they liked it. So she's like one of the most in-demand directors right now. And I'm, I'm all for it. Like, why not have loads of individual crazy takes on monster movies instead of trying to tie the whole fucking thing together like they did with their shitty dark universe? What a way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah, insightful. I was left, left a bit speechless after that, to be honest. <laughs> on positive news. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Sam. So you had the pleasure of interviewing the filmmaker. I did. I British did. filmmaker. And um, Peter Goddard. Tell us how that was, Sam. Tell us. <laughs> I've known Pete for a long time, for about around 10 years. Although we've never met, we've worked on numerous projects and we've written some stuff. So it was kind of cool to actually sit down and talk to him about his films and talk about some of the stuff that we did together. So without further ado, over to you, Sam. I'm on Trash Arts Take with Peter Goddard. How are you doing, man? You good? I'm doing very well. Very cold at the moment, but, uh, but coping. <laughs> It is so icy in the UK right now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's a it's strange times, isn't it? At the moment, it's uh, especially for like filmmakers, isn't it? To, uh, yeah, to try and uh, try and try and do anything. Yeah, try and get out there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you have to think that uh, different way. Yeah, I mean, what sort of stuff have you been up to at the moment? I mean, um, working on anything from from isolation or. There's a few things we're working on. Um, we're hoping to shoot something soon. Just trying to work out the best way to do it. We've been quite lucky. We've done a couple of films during the lockdowns. So it's not been too bad. Yeah? Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. You're always making stuff, though. You, you make, how many films have you made now? This isn't, you a, have, like, made... this isn't about me. <laughs> I can't no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you, you, you do amaze me, the, the, the kind of amount of output you... you, uh, you put out there and uh, I love it so it makes love sure. making yeah things, yeah so. I, yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> so what got you into filmmaking then Pete oh um I, do you know what? I have no idea it's um growing up I sort of had like a, a a love of kind of horror and things I used to when I was really young I used to kind of love Halloween and like kind of kind of like hammer horror films and sort of Dracula and kind of ghost stories and things and I think I remember watching Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror do you remember that from the 90s it used to be on like BBC2 you, you, may, you may be too young for it I don't think I remember, but I remember there was an episode yeah there was like an episode about Night of the Living Dead on there okay. and I must I must be very, yeah I must be very young probably eight or nine or something I remember seeing like there was a they show some clips from like the, the opening of the film where there was like some actors in, in like the graveyard you know, the opening scene with like Barbara and Johnny in the graveyard and I remember watching it and sort of thinking I live near a graveyard if, if I got a camera and two actors I can go and sort of make something like this and I think that was kind of the initial sort of like just urge to kind of try and do something like that and then yeah and then it wasn't in, I did then I went to like um, Brockenhurst College and did media and film studies so got into sort of making kind of shorts there and then it wasn't until sort of 2007 when I finished university and um 
I remember reading the local paper about these. There's a couple of films made in the local area. There's one called Freak Out and one called Small Town Folk, which mm-hmm. was made just just on the, down the road from me by some local filmmakers, and they they made this film and got it released and stuff. And this is kind of the the, the sort of time when digital cinema was taking off. So like the mini DV um, cameras were coming out, like the Sony PD150 or the and like the Canon XL1. So it was, it was sort of moving away from having to spend thousands of pounds on to shoot on film. Mm. You know, you could sort of make a film on on like a digital tape, and it sort of became affordable. And they'd made made their sort of film on these these like this sort of digital tape. And so I just sort of I think I was reading the the Gorilla Filmmakers Guide in the the, the uh, university library, and I just thought, you know what, I'm gonna gonna try and make a film. I remember that book, the handbook. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. Chris Jones. Mm. There's like there's like the handbook and the blueprint book and yeah, it's all kind of broke it all down to you and made it sort of seem like it you know it was something you can possibly go out and do and uh, no, I completely, that was it really. And <clears throat> I agree yep. with you. Um, there was um, I also for me it was also Rodriguez's um, Rebel that. Oh um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant book. Two key books. Yeah. Yeah, and it talks about him with, um, going selling his body for to to medical experiments to raise the money, like seven grand or whatever it was, to make El Mariachi, and mm. just how he how he filmed like that the, the machine guns that the he had a machine gun could only only fire one blank at a time, so he kind of took loads of different angles, just firing one blank and cut it all together to make it look like it's kind of like shooting loads of bullets at once, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. So this kind of led to your uh, first feature film, Season of the Witch. And with Season of the Witch, um, we, yeah. we, had, we had the chance to screen it in Portsmouth way back in, I think it was like 2011, 2012. Yeah, tell us a bit really? about Season of the Witch. Um, I mean, I had this idea for ages. And I, cause I have like a, like a love of like um, folk horror films and stuff like The Wicker Man and Witch Finder General and Blood on Satan's Claw. And I kind of always wanted to make a sort of folk horror type film. Hmm. And and I just sort of wrote this script that was, I thought that I could go and film for like I tried to try getting some money first of all from a, a um, do you remember Screen South? Yeah. You got Screen South, and they used to, they kind of like they used to have this kind of like they would offer funding for like ten grand or something to go towards projects and things, and um, I sort of I tried try getting money from them and then I tried looking into sort of local investors and stuff and in the end it was just like well. Let's just go out and make it. You know, I don't. I don't really know what I'm doing. I've, but I brought a camera, and I've got a bootleg version of Adobe CS4 or something. <laughs> let's just let's just let's just go and get some local actors together, and we're just going go and make this film and see what happens, really. <laughs> and then it was like I think about five years or something to make it in the end. And yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting, uh, interesting film. <laughs> it's not really not really a horror or anything, is it? It's, it's just a, a yeah. It's a long time ago. That it I was, saw it. But I remember it, it was um, a long time. Oh, yeah, have, have you actually watched it? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we screened it at our um, at one of the film festivals we did years ago. Um, I re- I remember you, scre- you screened Harvest of the Dead. I didn't realize you screened Season of the Witch as well. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the first one we did. Harvest of the Dead. Um, like couple must be like a year or two ago. But I remember the other one. Right, yeah, I remember- a long time ago. Blimey. What did you think of it? Because, <laughs> <laughs> um... Oh, it's, well, it's everyone's first film, so, you know. But you follow... Yeah. <laughs> it's a learning curve, isn't it? It's better than my first I mean, it's film. something. It, it's something, isn't it? <laughs> and it's still... It's just come out on Blu-ray as well. It's mad, isn't it? Yes. You, um, yeah. you followed that up with the ghost story, Any Minute Now, which, um, just... Yep. just I, the thing is, I remember from um, you did you did a documentary for us called uh, Terror on Films, and so I've got yeah. like little recaps of certain points in your career from when you were talking about that. But I remember you were really proud of uh, Any Minute Now when you were talking about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm never, I'm not really that proud of like anything I've made to be honest with you. But <laughs> I mean, uh, it was definitely um, a step up from from season. Um, I mean, with that one, I think we managed to get a bit of money from local investors, which went on hiring like better cameras and I mean, some you know half half decent actors and stuff in that. So um, Lee McDonald was in that. That's the first sort of time I worked with him, and uh, and 
what's her name from Braveheart and just a few other actors and it was, it was kind of a step up mm. from uh, from Season of the Witch it, yeah and it was just uh, let's let's try and do like because I, I was really into sort of like um, kind of like ghost stories like um, the, the work the stuff that um, Guillermo del Toro was making in Spain so like The Devil's Backbone and, and he produced a film called The Orphanage and I kind of really like sort of older kind of horror films stuff like The Haunting and um uh, what's the other one? Like Lay Die Bleak, is it that one? Or um, no, like the, t- the, the turn, of, turn of the Screw. Oh, yeah. What was that made into? Oh, yeah. That was the haunt. The Haunting's of Robert Wise one, and then what was the Turn of the Screw? Uh, the Innocents. That's it. Yeah, The Innocents. Yes, brilliant film. Yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, stuff like Donut now and things like that. So I wanted to trip once again. I was, I always try and like make these. Um, kind of slow burning character driven films and like try and like do kind of intelligent horror but but when you haven't got any money it's, uh, it's a bit difficult to, to kind of pull it off well but but you know I was, I was pleased with the end result it was definitely a step up from from the first film and uh, I think it's coming out on blu-ray this month oh, nice. from uh, dark side awesome good people to work with yeah 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 great team yeah great guy and the old Vince yeah yeah you know, he's a. Uh, they, they do kind of like really nice releases, and their British collection, isn't it? Mm. But you've had loads of your films out on. Yeah, we've had. We've been fortunate to have a good relationship with them. You've um, you've yeah. been, from like looking at your films, they are like distinctively British. Because I I remember obviously with Harvest of the Dead, although it's a slasher format, you use the, yeah. um, the iconography of the the play. Is it the Plague Doctor? Yeah, yeah. I can't remember where that idea of him came from, actually. I think I might have been in uh, the London Dungeon, and they had, like, the, the kind of plague, the kind of, like, the, the plague section there, and there was, like, wearing the mask, and I thought, that's that's a, that's a kind of a cool mask that I don't really recall being used in other films, mm-hmm. so we're allowed that way. I mean, Harvest of the Dead was the first kind of attempt of, like, making something that's more generic and kind of more saleable, you know, something... Something that you know we could get maybe like a better release on. Yeah, yeah. And, and that did that did quite well as well because that came out through SRS Cinema. They did like the Blu-ray and like a VHS release, and then Worldwide Multimedia did the standard DVD mm. and put it out on like video on demand and stuff. So but, yeah. No, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember when they um, they came out. And like one of the interesting things with Harvest of the Dead is you you decided to have a bit of a. Uh, anthology kind of element because um we had a film within it and um, you did it did and that was probably probably the best part of the film which was your, <laughs> your short bait wasn't it yes was it called bait um yeah y- yes it was yeah 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 and it was, uh, yeah. was it tez elliott's film as well if i got the name right yeah so it's uh, yeah yeah so like terence i've known for years and stuff and he's kind of had a little bit part so in like season of the witch he played like this drunk in a pub and in any minute now, I think he plays a police officer, and then Harvest of the Dead, he sort of stepped up more, and he kind of got quite involved with the writing as well, and had, like, came out of ideas and things, and and, uh, and with the, the sequel, he got kind of really involved with. That's why we've ended up having like a, a co-producer cred- uh, director credit on that one, and then I've, he's obviously um, made his debut feature, which is called Devil in the Woods, which is kind of one of the first films that Bitco are releasing now. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. On yeah, the new, the new, yeah, on the new upstarted Bitco label. Which is quite impressive because they they're doing like UK releases mm. and like paying for like the paying for like the BBFC certificates and things like that. So, so yeah, that's a, a, <clears throat> I'm hoping them the best with where they're going with it. I know, yeah. I think it's early days yet, and but they seem to be trying to do it right, aren't they? And and it could be like a really good company for independent filmmakers to to get involved with. So I just hope it hope it takes off really. Well, this is the thing, there seems to be, at least from like um, Horror on Sea and other independent filmmakers, there seems to be more of a regrouping of that community vibe where everyone's supporting each other in indie horror. And it's kind of nice to see yeah. in Britain, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've met a few people over the years who who seem to only want to make films because it's like an ego thing. Mm. You know, I think there's, there's like, you get these, you get some people like you and myself who just do it because we're passionate about it and we... You know, we have to make films and 
and you know if they do well if they don't do well you know it kind of doesn't matter to it doesn't matter to me anyway but you uh, i've come across a few people that have it's, it's just like an ego thing and like the power of being the director and you know want to do it for you know the kind of respect of it and they they're, they're sort of people to avoid yeah. they, they don't really care about like other, other people <laughs> other filmmakers but but yeah but there's a, there's like you know this kind of core group of people that all seem to want to support each other so like tony newton yeah yeah definitely he's one of the, he's one of those people he's one of those people that I, I was trying to think today like how i how i came across him and i he just sort of appeared one day yeah. just <laughs> on, on facebook and there he just was. appeared out of the mist and it, it was just like yeah i'm i'm, I'm i like your stuff do you know, do a short film for the Ryan's exploitation and he's like okay <laughs> He's a character. I, I remember we uh, we shot yeah. a film together, and yeah, he's proper Essex lad, Tony. Got oh, have you him. met him? Have you met him? Yeah, we we shot a trauma film together, a toxic schlock, a couple of years ago, and oh, all yeah, right, yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a fun guy. Yeah, he, he's just passionate about it as well. He just wants to. He just makes stuff and wants people to get involved, and, and he does really well as well. With the, the kind of releases, isn't he? He kind of gets stuff out there, and he has these good, good connections of like trauma and. Mm. And all that, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a it's a good community, I think. And there's there's like I said, there's good kind of like central kind of fan base or central kind of like group of people that that just sort of continue to do it and just continue to make films and want to support each other. And no, definitely. Yeah. It, and it, it, it's the thing is, it seems to be getting stronger. And like, it's really cool to see that you're obviously in for this year's horror on sea. Yeah, no. So I think I don't really do festivals because um, they normally cost a load of money to enter and stuff. And and I think I think with any minute now, I think I entered one or two and paid like fifty pound entry fees and didn't get selected. And so I just sort of give up on that and just go straight for the get out, get it like a distribution deal sorted. And don't, I don't sort of worry about the, the kind of festival mm. route. But but I think this year Horror and Sea were doing it like a free entry or something. And I think I missed a deadline, but I got in touch with him and said, you know, I've just finished this film. Would you be interested in looking at it for, because, you know, cause it's, it's free to enter. So if you if you could look at it and and see if you might want to screen it. And then they came back and were like, yeah, no, we, we selected your film and it's going to be screened. So and that's pretty is, cool. Um, it's quite far away. It's Essex, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Have you you've been before? I've been, yeah. I've, I've had the, I went last year and the year before. It's a long journey, but you don't worry about the journey. Yeah. Either. I mean, how how many hours is it like? Um, three hours or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll be probably a little hours. bit closer, aren't you? I, I'm Portsmouth, yeah. so I'm, I'm like right down south. Yeah, well, I'm I'm probably like an hour or so away from you, aren't I? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. No, it's a long journey. It's a very long journey. Yeah. But you meet so yeah. many great people. And um, what actually made you want to do Harvest the Dead Part Two? Well, we finished the first one. I think because the first one was done quite well in terms of like, I remember Terence. We, we had this idea for another another like script, and then Terence, it's Terence's idea. I can blame him, and he 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 said to me, "Well, let's let's strike while the iron is well lukewarm," because <laughs> it yeah because it was because it was doing well. It, it got that good like good release on Blu-ray and stuff, and and so we're like, okay, well we'll, we'll, we'll make a sequel. And I think. I think of all my films, I always look at them when I finish them, and I think, you know, I could have done it, could have done better. And now that I've learned so much, if I go back and do that again, I could, you know, I've got better cameras now, and I've got, you know, better understanding of colour grading or lighting and stuff. So if I if I could do the film again, then then I know I could do a better job. And so the idea of doing a sequel, it's like, well, we, we can do a better job than we did in the first one. And, uh, and we just thought it would be fun as well. It just, it's just a, a fun silly film <laughs> it's like zombies and it's like a zombie slasher film all thrown together with tim faraday as a mad doctor <laughs> that's the thing you've taken you've taken what sounds like the right attitude of a sequel and just to learn from it and have more fun with it yeah i think i think you learn from every film you make don't you every yeah. film you, you finish i think if you if you're always satisfied with what you do then then you never really pro- progress do you no you know, i was i was i was <laughs> I was just going to say, especially on an independent level, all you can do is learn to be able to progress, that's all. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 stuff's always advancing so much, and technology's always moving forward, and there's always, like, new things, and then, it, like, the whole kind of filmmaking process, everything from, like, 
you know, cameras and edited and color grading and sound design. There's so much to learn and, and to, you know, get good at that you, you, you never kind of stop, really. No, I completely agree. What do you think is going to be next, then? Do you have a next film? Um, I'm working on a script at the moment with Terence. So this, this has been one of the good reasons of lockdown is that we've been able to... To, to work on a script together so I'll, I'll write a section and then I send it over to him and he writes a bit and he sends it back and and uh, and yeah and we're just just working out ideas and things it's just it's, it's like another group of people go to the woods they, they go to go to go to like a, an illegal rave and then there's like a cult in the woods and nice and it's uh yeah so we, we always kind of like write with the idea of like you know something we can film for basically no money so a location which we can have access to and and kind of actors and stuff that we worked with before that we know that who are, who are good and will will want to work on it for for nothing really. And folk uh, horrors are quite popular right now as well, which so it's, it's like go, going all the way back to your roots of your season of the witch. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> no, I really like um, the work of like Ari Aster and stuff. So mm. I, I loved Her- Hereditary. I thought that was one of the best films of like past 10 years and then obviously Midsummer is very folk horror yeah, yeah. esque and then they got like The Witch as well which is like another really good kind of like folk horror type film so I don't know I think it's I, do, I like the kind of British traditions and things and the kind of like you know the English countryside is like just a really nice free location that you have access to and, and can use really no definitely do you ever have like a, this is probably one of the last question, but do you, do you have a dream project, one of those films, or it could be a franchise or a particular book that you, if you had any budget in the whole entire world, you'd want to do? Oh, I don't know. I have got the, we obviously had the graveyard shift that was one of yeah. our films that we were working on, wasn't it? I don't know. You you wrote a yeah you wrote a version of the script and then I, then I wrote tweaked it and that was kind of like the. Uh, you know, if I can get money to make that, then then I'd like to do that. And I had a producer who was who was working on it, and she sort of took it around a few places and and tried to get some sort of funding for it. And then it all sort of went very quiet. So, but I mean, I, I think I think it, that the kind of ba- the kind of basis of that idea is is still like a good idea. But I think it does need 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 like a sort of complete rewrite or something. But then like that would be kind of like a project. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, but I think my my favorite director is like Stanley Kubrick. So, so like a, a film, have the, the money and the, the freedom to make a film like he does. So I mean, some, I don't know, what would I? What would be a dream product? Project, some something big. So you just want to like, be on, be able to have that access to go. I don't need to create limitations here. Everything's yeah there. Yeah, I mean, someone like Christopher Nolan, he he kind of has that sort of freedom to to make these kind of like out there blockbusters, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what will be a dream project. It's all right. What about you? What would be your what would be your uh, your dream project, if, like from a book or anything? For um, <clears throat> I used to really want to make uh, William S. Burroughs Junkie. All um, oh, right. I really wanted to make that into a film for years. But there's always random projects where they kind of like, oh, that would be amazing. But then when it comes to stuff yeah. that you actually write, I've got, we've had a script called Suffer Well, which we wrote in 2012, 2013. And one day we'll make yeah. it. We just need the right, you know, the, that, the same thing that you want, that freedom to go, we can do this. We've got the money. Let's just go. Yeah, the money in it. It's just, we like, we like the graveyard shift. I kind of like, with the, the special effects and things, it's like, you know, I could go and make it on the cheap, but it will, you know, do the idea justice. I don't think. No, I agree because there so, was there was a great location in mind and with a really strong like centre character. The time will come for that. Yeah. Though. Yeah, and if it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't happen. I'm just happy to be, you know, able to go out and, and make stuff. Really, you know, that we're in we're in sort of our time where technology is cheap enough that you know anyone can get a, a camera, which is good enough quality to go out and and make something they can get released so yeah especially when you compare it to like yeah. you know back in video days and like you said with mini dv tapes mini dv tapes was still yeah. not something too easy that people were interested in distribution wise but we are in a lucky yeah. time 
And it's nice, again, with the whole communal vibe, we've got everyone in the same position who's just trying to work and get things done. Yeah. And hopefully, whenever uh, this whole lockdown finishes and things go back to sort of normality, then we can get back out there and uh, get making stuff. It'd be good, it'd be good to one day to meet up with you and actually, you know, work on something in person, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. It's something that I, especially when you have this time where you're just kind of locked in, and you think about all yeah. those people you know, and you're like, I should go and crew for them more. I should not be so nervous and just do it because I talk to them all the time anyway. So why not go and yeah. help them out? You know. Yeah. The time will come. Thank you very much for joining us, Pete. I hope everything uh, oh. goes well. And yeah, thank, thank you very much as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for for having me on. Like I said, I'm not the the, the best. Uh interviewee but <laughs> hopefully there's something out of something usable out of that <laughs> there always is man there always is i hope you have a lovely evening and i'll speak to you soon you too cheers sam speak soon bye-bye cheers cheers bye-bye thanks for that sam that was really insightful um so this week guys we decided well jack actually came up with an idea of um Revolution within films. Yeah, it's all my fault. Revol- yeah. <laughs> um, revolutionary films, etc. Um, so we all kind of did our own research on this. We, we have kind of, before recording, had a big discussion as to what we individually think, what films are specifically, well, our takes really on what a revolutionary film is or yeah. revolution within a film. And yeah, the results were kind of a little bit Weird. They range from whether or not Toy Story has any kind of revolution in it to, you know, some darker films which definitely have some revolution in it. Um, So really, I think for me personally, revolutionary films are very historically kind of based. Mm. I suppose that's what I found from my research and the, the four films that I've kind of got that jump out off the page most are films that are from specific time periods in history that are about revolution. And that's kind of the way I viewed it. And I know you guys probably have different takes on that. Well, I think it's important to remember that actual revolutions have happened across the world. And certain, certainly you get like those moments captured well in films. And um, I know that the films that you want to look at in particular are close to you. Yeah, well, two of them in particular. <laughs> Well, that, that's the thing to me. I, I, I was thinking in terms of like revolution as a much more sort of like structured thing of, of uh, uh, sort of uh, like working class type group overthrowing a uh, system and, and replacing that system in some way. Um, so we've all sort of like taken very different well, sort of angles, but it's interesting in that. Well, that's it. Like I see it from the structural sense that it's such a rudimentary thing used in films that what you just said could be also defined as the underdogs versus the establishment. Exactly. It's it's boiled down so simply in so many well, films. So having evil. a discussion, yeah, good versus and, evil. And and I think that the narrative, like the narrative structure of the majority of films, is that sort of equilibrium, disequilibrium, new equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. And that that again is like so intrinsic to that idea of revolution. Is it, it, almost any film you could say is about some form of revolution or, or you know, development. Just the, whether or not there's that kind of level of detail within it. Because yeah. I, I said about Toy Story 3, and mm. when they're in the nursery, they are overthrowing that kind of dictator bear. But really, whenever you come down to it, there is a little element of revolution within that film. Yeah. The whole overarching they story. They change everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, and it's not like... That's a small proportion. It's not overflowing or overthrowing the establishment as yeah, such yeah. and creating a new order. Well, if we look at um, Sorry to Bother You, Sorry yeah. to Bother You is a great modern example of how to do, how to have revolutionary ideas thrown in with magic realism and surrealism yeah. and just crazy stuff. Uh, it's Boots Riley's film, and essentially, the, the the key element within it is that that is very. It's very obvious because it is about your stature and it is about working from the bottom and then going to the top, but then realizing in doing so, everybody else is not going to the top. And because union is constantly spoken about, of course, you can't escape revolution without the idea of a union of people or a system coming together, whatever. But they explore it quite crazy in um, Sorry to Bother You by bringing in, of course, the, the horse people. 
Yeah. And that brings in this whole other element because the evil CEO, played by everyone's favourite evil rich guy, Army Hammer, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he essentially wants to, he's already being a bit Jeff Bezos and make people work in warehouses, but he's built homes within the warehouses. And the next step to him is to have horse people to do all the jobs. And he wants the main character to be the leader of the horse people. And because, of course, his whole entire career structure has been rising to the top kind of thing. But he doesn't. He does what revolution needs. He rejoins the union, gets the horse people involved, and they change things. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I think that's one of the important aspects of a lot of revolution films is, is groups of people coming together, mm. um, you know, despite sort of differences and stuff, because they have the same goals. Um, like you see that kind of in 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 Land of the Dead in some ways, like uh, that that idea of the zombies and the 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 people. I mean, I know the people have got like slightly different objectives. It's not like a revolution that's happening um, uh, in the working class of the Land of the Dead film. Um, well, this it's it, it, it's more like uh, they're just trying to hold them hostage, isn't it? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. George A. Romero clearly made a very, like, obvious structure with it. You know, the rich literally live in, at the top of the building. The middle mm. class are in, <clears throat> in the middle, just kind of living a normal life or trying to. What? But the world is completely destroyed from the zombie apocalypse. It's yeah. clearly part of the original trilogy. But the zombies are not the enemy. It's, the, it's, it's literally <clears throat> the economic power stru structure the zombies come together and start to relearn how to do things. And there's one point when the zombies are about to eat someone and because the leader of zombies stops them and gets them to join the pack again, where they just march forwards and go for those who have oppressed them, essentially, because they want to target the rich. They're not going after anyone else. They're going, we've got a bigger target to hit and we'll work together to take it down. And that, like, <clears throat> it feels very, like, direct what Romero is saying. It is that idea of that we all unite together, we can do it. Don't in, take individual attacks, focus on the goal to collective and it can be changed. Yeah. I think if, if you're going off something like that, that kind of ties into one of my picks, which is like Miz. Yeah. Um, and like Miz is that whole idea of um, being suppressed by the hierarchy, you know, and living in rough times, poverty, stuff like that, and a coming together of group of people who then revolt mm. and try to overthrow the establishment. I can't remember what it's number... It's French Revolution, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But I can't remember if it was King Louis. I don't know what number he was. King yeah, Louis VII. They've had a lot. They've had a lot. They've had a lot of Louis. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's but yeah, that, that whole idea then, and um, yeah, it's just that coming together and um, that unified unification, I suppose, that if you have enough people with the same goal. They might have different ideas of how to get there, but they have ultimately the same goal. Yeah, yeah. And that's what Les Mis kind of tries to get towards. Yeah. It's always a goal for equality, essentially, as well, isn't it? Yeah. Or, or a only... change, or at least a change to the sort of hierarchy that makes it more equal, if not completely yeah, yeah. equal. Yeah. So rather than living in poverty, they can have enough money to get by. Sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think with Les Mis, though, even though it is a revolution and eventually, you know, they kind of did win out. That specific period for Les Mis actually is quite tragic. Mm. So even though they had that revolution, it actually inspired more revolutions off the back of it because yeah. of the way that they were put down and treated by the, the government. Which it was, is, it, it's kind of like a revolution that inspired a revolution. Yeah, yeah, there was quite a few of them. Uh revolutions around that time. I can't mm. remember what, what Les Mis was specifically a, targeted. Those real events, though, have been like so used in Western cinema to, to be that structure of what we said of the good versus the evil, of the people who are at the bottom who are trying to take the overarchy to make it all good again. And it's interesting that Les Mis, like, I, I, I don't know when Les Mis was written, but obviously it's based on certain events. And you feel like lots of things have based it on that structure of Les Mis, not, not the singing, but everything <laughs> else within it, you know? To randomly connect it, like South Park, the South Park movie, uses the structure of Les Mis, of course, musically and st structurally. Because obviously the parents want to overtake the businesses who they think, or the Canadians, are destroying their, you know, the morality of their children. And of course the children are, are trying to create a revolution to go, no, we actually matter and listen to our voice instead of just going with well, what you think's right. But they include the singing. Yeah, they include <laughs> the singing. But it still works in that same way. And I think 
in a weird way, South Park understands the power of what Les Miserables does. And a lot of people don't just go, oh, that's a film about singing. They know what it's about. They know mm -hmm. it's a film about the French Revolution. They know immediately. And I think South Park understood that by taking that song and using it and applying it to it. Because they themselves, in, as an industry, are constantly having to be fighting a, a revolution against the... Um, the fucking rating system. I think the the writers for South Park as well are very very intelligent writers. Yeah. Like they've written a load of um, other musicals that have made it onto Broadway and stuff, and um, and a lot of them are very kind of politically driven. Well, the funny thing is, by doing that, attacking the rating system in that kind of revolutionary sense, they had a lot of swearing, and the film made lots of money. <laughs> so they kind of won their revolution in yeah. some ways. I think it's it's interesting whenever it comes to revolution, because you like in a lot of films like what you were saying, Sam. <clears throat> you have good versus evil. Yeah. You have the villain. You have got the hero, and it's very very black and white. Mm. But sometimes within revolution, especially whenever it's based on true events or historical um, accuracies, the lines become blurred. Yeah, yeah. So two of the films that I've got here actually take place across the same time period. But they're from two different perspectives of, you know, civil war and the divide. So The Wind That Shakes the Barley and Michael Collins. So both of them are set around the late 1910s. So 1919, 20, 21. And it's all about the guerrilla warfare. So you had like the Easter Rising in 1916. For anyone who doesn't know about the Easter Rising, basically a ragtag group of what was then the IRA. And... Um, basically did guerrilla warfare against British troops. They realised that the British were preoccupied with the war going on. So in an effort to fight back and get Irish independence, they basically set themselves up in Dublin and um, held out for, I think it was four days. And from the perspective of the British and everyone outside of the British, everyone now looked at it and was like, oh, hold on a second, the British Empire isn't exactly what it is. You had these ragtag sort of... Um, civilians who fought against them, like surely they should have just put them down. So that was massive, that was a massive win for Irish people and in the fight for their independence. But what then ended up happening is in 1921, you have what is now known as the Republic of Ireland became a free state. It was a vote and stuff, and the six counties that make up Northern Ireland stayed with Britain, but fully controlled, was the rest was... Um, which, yeah, became a free state. Now, what ended up happening then is you have the IRA splitting off into two groups, so the provisional and the real. Michael Collins was in the one that wanted to kind of go a bit more political and work with Parliament to try and get their independency. The other IRA faction decided that, no, we've gotten this far with guerrilla warfare and fighting, let's keep doing that. But now you cause civil war between the two IRA groups. And, um, yeah, it, it's... It's really cool because the wind that shakes the barley shows us from the violent side. Cillian Murphy's in that. Um, Ken Loach, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it shows it from the violent side and you see what their perspective is in terms of how they're going to get their independence, full independence. <coughs> and then Michael Collins with Liam Neeson and it shows it from, let's go down the, the, um, the more political route. And then, <laughs> coincidentally, Michael Collins ended up getting assassinated by the other IRA group because they were against what he was doing. And I think that's just really interesting in terms of revolution, that you can take a point in history, and even though they're going for the same thing, it's not black and white, and you have this divide, and who's well, this right in that scenario? Perspective is so important when you're telling a story about revolution. Sorry about the Irish history lesson. There. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, Oliver Stone's Salvador, which is essentially about um, a war photographer who's in Salvador at the time when there was the revolution going on. Essentially, he sides at first he's not with them on you know what's going down, but they eventually sides on them. And you see that a lot in cinema where there is always, unfortunately, usually the white man going into a situation, seeing that revolution is necessary, and then aiding it along. I only say unfortunately because it's usually got to be through a Western white side to be able to see it. Um, on a really random perspective, but it works so well, Rise of the Planet of the Apes mm. puts you in the eyes of the ape. Yeah. And that really makes you totally tie into feeling like, no, they need their revolution. They need to get out of there. The humans have been treating them as, you know, animals. 
Yeah. And they've obviously got their intelligence because of the gas and stuff. It was kind of, in a sense, a symbolism there. Because um, if you look back through evolution and stuff, we're, well, I don't want to say relatives. Relatives is the wrong word. But we basically are ancestral to the apes, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. So it's almost like if you created, um, if you go back to that building idea of a social sort of spectrum of or like a class system yeah, yeah the apes would be at the bottom of that class yeah, system yeah. looked down yeah. upon mistreated and it's them coming together to well this is it the important thing with rise of the apes though is they're not coming together to take out mankind they just want to find a land they can call their own and let mankind be separate whereas of course that is still a revolution in itself because yeah. they're trying to change the system that right they're trying now, to make a new system within like yeah somewhere isn't it a new state kind of thing yeah and it, it paints the obviously the enemy in it as humans mm. and the fact that they experiment on animals and the cruelty and stuff and it's unique to see it from the ape perspective and a lot of that works again this is important for revolution it's all about who's acting in that role and then with Rise of the Apes you've got Andy Serkis who obviously is a genius behind mocap and really convinces you that he's this little ape and you see him rise from youth to it's a very clever way to tell a quite important story mm. for a mass audience. And sometimes they get it right when they get a mass audience concept of revolution. Uh, even though it's like dwindled down to a lot of good versus evil, there is times when you go, I know what that's about, I know what that's clicking to. Yeah. And as you said with that film, it's like, it, it's so important that it focuses in from their perspective. Yeah. Because from the human perspective, the whole thing would have looked really different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I think you but can't the really portray thing... the apes as being the bad guys in no, that scenario. No, exactly. It would have a completely different feel to it. Exactly. And, that, that, and that, that's the thing that revolution films seem to do a lot, is like they focus in on the characters that are doing, like, taking the revolutionary action. But, but one that sort of flips that and does it the opposite way is us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, in, in us, they, they follow the, uh, the, the, well, the, the human characters essentially. And it, yeah, and it yeah. plays it out like a, like a horror film where they, you know, they don't know what's happening. These doppelgangers are showing up of them and attacking them. And as the film goes on, you come to realize that this is a mass underclass that yeah. is uh, essentially rising up. rising up and taking, uh, live underground, taking right? their own power back. Um, and, and so like it just yeah flips that on its head and, uh, and, uh, and shows revolution in a very different way. That, that What's interesting though is because you get the reveal at the end of us where the human that we're meant to believe that we're following is the human, it's not, it's the switch mm. in it. It's a doppelganger who got to live the normal life and it's the human who was actually suppressed and underneath the ground with all the other doppelgangers. Like that in itself, Flips it, flips it again. Yeah, yeah. Well, the very fact is those doppelgangers, they're the society that they literally ignored and just put them down below and they lived, everyone lived their normal lives. So to put revolution into a horror context of making the main characters, you know, essentially the upper class in that regards, is that putting that fear idea of going, one day they'll rise up. They won't mm. be forgotten and ignored and eventually they will rise up. Yeah. And that's what makes that weird juxtaposition in Us where it's like, it's a positive ending, Mm. Because they've risen up, but because you've been watching a horror film and most of it, you've been terrified of these characters. Yeah, it's a very clever thing to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you come to the end of that film, and you're kind of on their side. Um, yeah, and it's yeah, there's not many horror films that can get you to <laughs> on the side of the person. It yeah. is, uh, yeah, the the thing that's supposed to be scaring you. Yeah, yeah. To totally throw a, a different, an entirely different angle on, on revolution, because we talked uh, quite a lot about some really sort of serious films. Um, one that I wanted to talk about is actually Mean Girls, um, <laughs> which most people w wouldn't necessarily think of. Some might argue that it's a very serious film. <laughs> revolution, but, but from, uh, in some ways it, it really is, because those, the, the sort of main, the main characters that we're following plot to uh, essentially overthrow the system uh, yeah. of hierarchy within their, within their high school and um, in causing sort of mass uh, unrest uh, they, uh, they eventually do change the structure and at the end of the film you see that that structure is broken down and that idea of hierarchy yeah, is yeah. no longer there. But there's still the sort of, at the end they, they show that there's still the threat of it, you know, coming back kind of thing. Um, so it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting one when you think of it in that way. Um, yeah. I've never really thought of it like that. 
I thought of it as just like a chick flick. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when you break it down, yeah. Well, Tina Fey's an, an incredible writer and she, she does really sort of, you know, put a lot of work into mm. into what she's writing. Um, so even if it sort of comes across as a bit sort of like, you know, um, other stuff that she's done, it, it, it's still got like a very intelligent message behind it. It kind of reminds me a bit of um, Heathers. Heathers being the 80s film, <clears throat> which again has that whole hierarchy of how the high schools run. And then because they one of the characters like we need to take down the hierarchy, they make him they kill him and they make it look like a suicide. Uh -huh. But because they do it, the school responds by doing this. We need to do suicide awareness. It becomes this huge mm. thing, and you think they're trying to do it to change the hierarchy, but really this guy wants to cause, in this film's version, anarchy. Yeah. He wants things to see. He wants to blow up the school by the end of the film. He's really similar to the Joker, really, but. It is interesting because school has that hierarchy where there is a system that shouldn't be there and as soon as you go, especially in particular of course, American high schools, you're going into a system that has a hierarchy and you've been placed here and that's where you're going to be for the next four years of your life. And it's interesting when films do go, all right, well, let's see what happens when that's changed. Mm. And I think those two, they're, they're good examples of doing that kind of thing. There, there probably are other examples that have tried, but... You know, it's still teenage movies, so it's still got to play to a certain audience at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, sorry, you, you you said something there about like the idea of things being fixed. You you're stuck in this position, and uh, it just immediately made me think of the Lego Movie. Yeah, um, yeah which yeah. is is literally <laughs> about that, and the, you know how uh, Lord Business, the evil cor you know the evil corporation, wants to keep things stuck together, and you know make sure things can never change. And uh, it sort of t takes creativity and, and new thinking um, uh, in order to change, you know, to keep things um, free, you know, and to be free. Well, there's the whole thing in that film where they talk about him being the master builder and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And you're like, oh, okay, so it's a significant one. He's the one, the only one that can save it and all that. But then, of course, Morgan Freeman's character dies and he's like, there is no master builder. We yeah. all just need to come together and be creative and we can overtake it. And that's a beautiful idea, rather than forcing that concept of it's always down to the individual. No, it's come together. Yeah. Put your ideas together and things will work out in the end. Mm. And, and I think the, the f like him being the sort of the chosen one, if you like, he's yeah, such yeah. a regular, non, like, you know, he's, he's not exactly uh, anything special yeah. in any way particularly whatsoever. And it's, and it's that sort of idea that makes makes them realise that that's how they need to work, is not to think of themselves as like someone special and a hero particularly, but part of a, a mass. Yeah, and that leads me right into Star Wars! <laughs> <laughs> More specifically, A New Hope. Because like, whenever A New Hope came out in um, 1977, I think like the idea of it was, you know, this regular farm boy, <clears throat> um, kind of gets whisked up into this whole battle against the Empire, the established Empire, and they got to bring them down, so they got, obviously, the, the planet-killing device, and the Death Star. And it's it's interesting, because they overthrow them, they defeat the evil at the end of the day, but it goes to show, a bit like, you know, you're saying with the Lego movie, it's that just this regular dude who had a bit of belief, and, you know, had people that supported him and trusted him, they actually managed to with a rebellion, managed to overthrow. Well, the thing is, at the end of the day, these films are designed for either children or family audience. And that's a good moral, right? That's a good moral thing to tell in yeah. a film, that if you work together and support each other, you can do great things. Mm. So it's, it's good that revolution is used so freely in mainstream films, even if they're made by giant corporations who would never want to see a revolution in a million years. Yeah. It's still well, it's good almost... that you're giving that idea to children. And yeah. Lego Movie does it perfectly because it doesn't hide around it. Yeah. It makes it a little bit more clear that we're talking about a certain thing here. Yeah, it gives you the freedom to an analyse it a bit more on yeah. that, uh, in that perspective without it sort of feeling like, am I overthinking this? Is this just mad? <laughs> cool, guys. So we hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please, if there's any films that you can think of, please leave a comment and let us know what them films are and your thoughts of them. Please leave a like, 
subscribe, ring the bell as well to be notified for any future Trash Arts videos. And also, why not check out our website? Um, we've recently launched a load of new merch as well, so you can get some Trash Arts stuff and some Open Your Mouth stuff as well. Which so is on this Monday. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, Open yeah. Your Mouth is on tomorrow at 8 o'clock, live stream. And um, we got some great acts and stuff on there. We've actually done a video for Will Bill. Um, yeah, cat, cat, cat video. Puppets. <laughs> so yeah, check out the website. That's www.trasharts.co.uk. And other than that, guys, hope you enjoyed. Trash Arts Takeout. Bye. Ta-da.